Okay, thank you, Andrea. Hello, everybody. My name is Magda Carr. I'm from Newcastle University. Sorry, it's just cut off the top there. Um, and I also did some experiments at HSVA as part of the Hydra Plus project. So the team that supported me from HSVA were Kala Evers, Pisa Zimmer, Andrea Haas, and Liz Shaw. And I'd like to thank all that team, but in particular Kala and also Andrea for their fantastic support they gave me both during the campaign and also before, and excellent hospitality again, so thank you both very much. And the team of academics that were involved in the project are listed here. And we came from a range of backgrounds, so we had two mathematicians who were um, Emilia Paro from UEA and also Henrik Kalish from Bergen, Ilka Fur and Peter Sutherland are oceanographers, Ivan Team and um, Yala Bernstein are numerical analysts, and myself and Atma Jensen are experimentalists. And we were interested in looking at how internal solitary waves propagate under different ice conditions. So internal solitary waves are finite amplitude waves of permanent form, and they travel along density interfaces in stably stratified fluids. Okay, and their properties are strongly influenced by the nature and form of the upper and lower boundary um, surfaces in the containing basins in which they propagate. So as the polar oceans evolve to a seasonally more ice-free state, and as our upper boundary condition changes in the Arctic Ocean, we expect the internal wave field to be affected by that change at surface. Okay, so internal solitary waves are also known to play a key role in the vertical mixing of upper layers, which in turn affects renewal of nutrients and also sea ice formation. They're also known to cause flexure of sea ice, and theoretical studies suggest that they are responsible for the formation of ice bands in the marginal ice zone. And some recent work has shown that nonlinear internal waves are linked to enhanced mixing in the Arctic Ocean. Okay, as we've previously heard um, from Andre, the, in the marginal ice zone you can get ice types of various types. I'm just going to quickly mention four. So grease ice, my first example there, is a kind of slushy kind of ice you get. It forms when phrasal crystals within the water column begin to coagulate together. And you think of that behaving a bit like a viscous fluid layer. It's mushy, it's soup-like. The second example is nilus ice. So this is a thin, elastic crust of ice that forms at the surface of the ocean. And that can bend with waves and swell. You can have pancake ice, so these circular discs of ice, which in time raft and get larger and thicker in extent. And finally, level ice, which is just defined to be a continuous piece of ice. And these can vary vastly over different scales and shapes and sizes. So the message is, at the, upper ocean, at the upper surface in the Arctic Ocean, we can get surface conditions that change from open ocean to a soupy-like fluid to an elastic type of ice to solid ice. OK, so in the lab, we had a wave flume, which was six, six meters long. It was 0.48 meters wide, and it was 0.6 meters in depth. And we began our experiments by stratifying the tank. So we mixed up some salty brine solution of a density of 1,045 kilograms per meter cubed. And we put that in the lower layer of the tank. So the density row three was this dense salt water. We then had an array of sponges that we put in the layer, And we very slowly pumped in fresher fluid with a density of 1,025 kilograms per meter cubed on top. So as a result, what we got is we had a stratification where the lower layer was deep and salty. We had a thinner, homogeneous upper layer. And in between the two, we got um, a stratification where we had a linearly stratified pit and pipe separating those two bodies of water. So once the tank was stratified, we left it to diffuse overnight. And the next morning, we put a gate at the upstream end of the tank. And behind the gate, we filled with fluid, which had a density row one. So that was the fresher fluid. So the density behind the gate matched the density in the upper layer in the main section of the tank. So that, that gives rise to a density gradient. So if we look at that gate, on the side behind the gate, we've essentially got the fresher fluid, whereas in the main section of the tank, it's mainly salty and denser. So when we lift the gate out, the fresher fluid wants to rise, the salty fluid falls, and that causes a disturbance on the picnic line, which propagates into the main section of the tank as an internal salty wave of depression. OK, so that's how we made the wave. The variable we were interested in was the ice. So we had half of the surface was open water, and then we had ice 
on the surface um, as the wave propagated on, along underneath it. And we concentrated on three different kinds of ice, grease ice, level ice, and the ice. I'll show you some pictures in just a second. And um, to visualize the flow, we seeded the water column with neutrally buoyant light reflecting tracer particles, and we illuminated from below. So the base of the tank was transparent, and we had um, a light sheet beneath, so that made a thin um, slice of light, and we viewed from the side. So you're going to be looking at a two-dimensional slice of the flow from the side of the tank. Um, from those movies, we're able to use PIV to get the velocity field. To measure density, we had microconductivity probes set up above the tank. So we drove them down through the water column. They measured conductivity. And as the salinity of the water changes, the conductivity readings change. And hence, we can get the density profile from those probes. We also had a thermistor put behind the gate so we could measure the temperature in the water column as well. So here are the graphs. So we did these experiments in the public environment with test basin. So the blue basin you see here is normally full of water, but for our experiments the, the basin was drained and the guys at HSV custom built us this gray structure which is our wave pool. So in this image here you can see the game. So this is just um, a red piece of plastic essentially. Um, highly sophisticated, that's what we use to generate the wave pool. Okay, so it's just a barrier. Here this is just an example of the sponges we use for the stratification. And this image I've included here, this big mess of dirty old blankets, that actually covers up all our cameras and computers. So we work with temperatures down to minus 15, so we had to protect those. So hence the blankets. This tarpaulin construction you see here came from Keller's backyard. He made that for us because what we found was in between experiments, when we raised the temperature in the lab, if we did that too quickly, we got a lot of condensation and we effectively made it rain. So again, we had to protect the electrical here. So there was a lot of kind of practical considerations that we had to overcome. Okay, so the first example I want to show you is the grease ice. So this is kind of slushy, mushy ice, if you like. We made it in a different facility, and then we just added it to the top of our experiments when we wanted to run experiments. So I'm going to show you a couple of movies now. These should hopefully be synchronized in 10 minutes that go away. The top one is a plan view, looking down on the top surface and the bottom image is a side view looking into the underneath the underneath the ice from the side. So I'll just play this. So what you're going to see here is an internal wave propagating on this pinky plane coming in this direction. And you'll see as this wave propagates, it induces a current at the surface which compresses that grease ice and transports it in the same direction as the internal wave. And if I just let this play out, what's happening now is the wave is hitting off the end wall of the tank and it's going to be reflected back upstream. As it becomes reflected back upstream again, you can see the surface induced current is transporting that ice back up the tank. And I don't know how well you can see here, but if you look closely, what we also saw was on the underside of this ice, we got small vortices forming wherever you had any rough features. Okay, so the next example is the Miller size. So to make the Miller size, we actually made this in the tank. So we had styrofoam covering half the tank to stop the surface from freezing. We reduced the temperature in the lab and we froze the surface. This is a very thin elastic sheet of ice. It was free to move vertically, but we froze all the way to the end. So this time, this one's not free to move horizontally. And also, you can see there's some roughness associated with this ice because with time, we got these ice structures grown down into the water column. Okay, so this time if I can just play this again, we're looking down and also from the side. Okay, so this time as the ice comes along, you see that that ice sheet's not free to move. There wasn't enough vertical surface from the wave to make it move vertically, but if you look closely at the other side of the ice, on the lee side of that rough feature, we get these small vortices forming. Okay, and the last example is the uh, level ice, or the um, sheet ice. So we looked at two different thicknesses and two different lengths. So we looked at a one centimeter thick sheet, 
which was a meter long, and we also considered a six centimeter um, thick sheet, and we looked at a one meter slab and also a two meter slab. And I'm just going to show you an example from the thick ice, which was one meter. So here you can hopefully see three movies stitched together. Okay, and this time you can see the ice is so thick, it actually comes down very close to the picket line. So in this case, we actually got interaction between the wave and the ice edge. Also, let's play. And what you'll see is as a result of that interaction between the wave and the ice edge, this wave actually goes unstable and breaks. And we get this roll appearing on the picket line. We looked at two different amplitudes. So this was the biggest amplitude case, and you can see it's clearly deformed by that interaction. We looked at a smaller amplitude wave. And the interaction was so strong, the signal was actually completely killed by the interaction with that ice edge. OK, so just some quick results. So here I'm showing you some results from time series. So in this first column, we're looking at stills from the experimental image. And we're going sequentially in time from top to bottom. So you can see we've got a wave propagating along from left to right. And you can see that the, the um, ice sheet at the top it's being transported by the wave. So what we can do is we can take a column in these images. So this vertical dashed white line you see, we say, let's fix that column and return it for every time step in my movie and line them up from left to right. So this image here, in the you see, is when we've done that. And as a result, we get a trace of the wave shape. From that, we can measure the amplitude of the wave. We can also identify the time at which the trough is at its maximum extent. And we can do that at different locations, and in that way we can get a measure of the wave speed as it goes through. We can also take a horizontal slice through these images as well. So if we take the horizontal dash line you see there, I've made that coincide with this ice sheet. So we take those horizontal slices, turn them through 90 degrees, and then stack them on it. And then here you can see from these traces, we can trace the edge of the ice. So I have color, this is our ice sheet, and the black is the water. And you can see how the ice edge moves as this wave approaches. So the ice edge is initially accelerated by the wave, and then it reaches a constant speed before it hits the end goal of the time. So we can just put a straight line to where the speed is constant and get a measure of the speed of the ice. And what we found when we looked at those measurements of the ice speed was that the speed that the ice moved at looks to be more dependent on the length of the ice flow than the thickness. OK, so the thickness doesn't appear to control the speed at which it moves for the range of thicknesses we looked at, but the length had a strong effect. These are some results from the PIV. So the first column is for the grease ice case. So this dashed line here marks where the ice edge was. So to the left of here, we had open water. To the right, we're underneath the grease ice. The next column is where we had Miller's ice, and we had complete ice cover. And the third case is the level ice case. And again, I'm just demarking the ice edge of that black line. The first row of images is the horizontally computed velocity field. OK, and if we just look at the ice itself, first of all, you can see that the grease ice and the level ice are moving because we've got kind of red signal there. But they're moving at a speed which is less than the wave at your speed below. Whereas the miller ice is stationary. That's marked by the white shape you see there. The next row you look at is vorticity. And you can see that if you look at the miller size case, the vorticity signal of the ice is strongest in the miller size case. And we think that's purely because the miller size was stationary. So the velocity gradient underneath the miller size directly beneath is going to be greater than the other cases. But if you also look at the vorticity signal underneath the grease ice and underneath the level, it looks as if the vorticity signal under the grease and the millet extends over a bigger vertical extent than what occurs in the level case. So that suggests that in these two cases, the boundary layer, the turbulent boundary layer beneath the ice, is bigger. And we think that's due to roughness effects. Okay, so the grease ice and the level ice had roughness associated with them. Sorry, the grease and the millet, whereas the level was very smooth. And finally, the bottom here, these are just dissipation plots based on the PIV velocity measurements. And again, it's difficult to say for sure, but it looks as if we're getting stronger dissipation underneath the grease and the nilis than what we are in the level ice case. 
Thank you. Okay, and again, this is just the dissipation. So now we can dissipation profile. So we took a kind of um, a section in the middle part of those last images I showed you. There's some very faint lines on here which you can't really see. These are all the dissipation profiles. We then took the horizontal average of them for the three different ice cases. And again, these tend to suggest that the boundary layer underneath the vanilla site and the deep ice is thicker than under the level ice case. Okay, so finally, just to round up some conclusions. So what have we seen? We've seen that the interaction of internal solitary waves with sea ice can lead to dissipation of energy through the following pathways. We get the generation of vortices at the underside of the ice if you have roughness effects. We've seen transportation of the ice and also deformation of the waveform. Um, in the lab, our buoyancy frequency and Reynolds number are very different to what you get in the field. And we didn't have time to vary these things at all, so that's something that we need to do if we want to try and infer how this would scale up to the ocean. And of course, we've got the problem that Alexi mentioned earlier, the thickness of our ice doesn't scale in the same way as the amplitude of our waves do. So that's things that we need to look at in the future, which we hope to do. And we'd also like to look at varying the thickness of the flow and the length of the flow more. And finally, I would just like to finish by thanking everyone who's been involved with HydroLab, from the founding members to the people that have kept it going. It's been a fantastic opportunity for me, and uh, I really appreciate being involved. So thank you to all the people who've been involved with HydroLab. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you, Martha, very much. I think we can take uh, two short questions. So, yes, please. Uh, how did you make this level wise? Did they on the top of, uh... Yeah, so it, it just, we have um, a facility where they can make, they, it actually came from different facilities, from the, the LIM. So we have the LIM there, so we took the levelized frozen from the large basin. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, okay. <laughs> so we took it from a different facility and we, we cut it, so it was cut out of a sheet that was made for another experiment, and then we put it onto boards of um, wood, kept it in a fridge until we needed it, a full storage unit, and then we lowered it into our experiment before it started, and we just then pulled the book. So it was tricky, actually. We lowered the ice and the wooden board into our specification, and then we slid the board out from underneath the ice and took the board away. So the bottom surface was smooth? Yes. But in the field, it's not smooth? No. So yeah, we... absolutely. So there's roughnesses there. And I think we saw you know, the difference in the roughness, whether we saw you know, in the grease and the nil size case, if you have rough features, you've got these vortices forming. Whereas in the level ice case, we didn't, and that's why this vorticity signal was weaker in that case. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting uh, presentation. And uh, we learned a lot of uh, great dissipation and uh, dynamics. Um, what I wonder is, can you tell me a little bit more about the use of practice, let's say the uh, real life? Yeah, so at the minute, so the kind of motivation I gave you at the start, there's been various field observations, but they've been fairly sparse due to the ice cover. And just recently, since we've had that prolonged ice retreat, there's just been some new work published showing SAR imagery of the internal wave signal at the surface of the ocean and also some measurements to show how the thermocline's been disturbed. So we know now that these internal waves do exist in the Arctic and people think they're more widespread than what we'd initially thought. So one application is to look at the the general dynamics within the Arctic and have a, see if we can understand better how internal waves interact with sea ice and vice versa, because at the minute very little is known. So that, that's one application. The other application is if we look at, um, we can look at floating bodies, so large floating offshore platforms, so it might be an airstrip or a runway. And again, there's, there's applications there, not necessarily ice at the surface, but some kind of structure. If it's a short one, we can take one more, I guess. So yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so this was like a good opportunity. Yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, this was a great opportunity for us to try with real ice, and what we hope to do now is some experiments where we have fake ice, but we've got these real case scenario ones that we can compare to. So yeah, so future work, we're going to try and do some things with 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 so 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 
you can kind of get a thin latex sheet for, for example, for an elastic sheet. We can look at form in different structures with styrofoam. Yeah, it might be better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thank, thank you, Martha, and thank every.